Hi. Welcome to the talk. Uh, we are here to listen to John Maddock. Yeah. And he's about to speak uh, about uh, sustainable computing. And he needs no more presentation. Uh, if you were about to ask a question, please uh, uh, ask for a microphone. Thanks. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure to be here and once again addressing DEPCONF. Um, I am the executive director of Linux International. That and $350 will probably get you a cup of coffee almost any place. A lot of people say, Mad Dog, he's an evangelist for free software. He looks like Papa Noel. Uh, but what other reasons for should we listen to him? Well, I started programming over 40 years ago. And I've been programming commercially for 39 years. I used a large number of IBM mainframes in the very beginning. But then I switched over to equipment from Digital Equipment Corporation, PDP-8s, PDP-11s, and so forth, and VAX computer systems. I've been using Unix since 1977. I was a senior systems administrator for Bell Laboratories in the United States. And in 1994, I met Linus Torvalds, went over to using Linux, and haven't ever looked back. I've been a programmer, I've been a systems administrator, I've taught computer science, I've taught operating system design, I've taught compiler design. And although I admit a lot of my C language looks like Fortran, uh, I've been in a lot of the places you've been. And I've worked on very large systems and extremely small systems. But most importantly, I've been both a vendor and a customer. I know what it's like to try and create code that meets the customer's needs. I know what it's like to be a customer waiting for that bug fix or for that extension. And I know the difficulty of doing both. And that's why I also believe in free software. But then again, maybe I'm just an old man. And this is one of my favorite Dilbert cartoons. It says, the person on the left who is the applicant for the job I have all the job requirements that you asked for. I have an IQ of 300. I've won several Nobel Prizes. I have two centuries of Unix experience. And the reason I could do that was because I invented the time machine and came back in time. And I have an immortality drug that I invented. And, dog, and the evil HR person says, that's a lot of words for just being too old. <laughs> But I'm here today to talk about sustainable computing. And a lot of people say, is this a trick question? You know, what is sustainable computing? Well, it's just what it says. Computing that you can sustain, computing that keeps going forward, computing where you don't have to keep backing up in order to go forwards again. And we need to think about several different things when we think about sustainable computing. One of them is a low amount of electric usage. A small footprint on the Earth. We'll see what that means in a few minutes. It should be easy to use so that people can uh, utilize it in, in every part of their life. We need to think about the people who are very, very poor and people who are not so poor. And I'll explain more about that. We should think about the longevity of the solution. How long is it going to last? And finally, we should have a sustainable business model based around this. And that last is very important. I know a lot of you think of yourselves as technologists and engineers, and that's fine. But we also have to think about the business model of free software, because that's very important to keep it going. Now the first one, the first point I'm going to talk about is usage of electricity. Some of you may recognize this, the Aitupu power plant it is the world's largest active power plant, hydroelectric plant, power plant. It generates 14 gigawatts of electricity every hour. That sounds like a lot. It is a lot. It produces 15% of all of the electricity that is used by uh, Brazil and 90% of all of the electricity used by Paraguay. Now, if you take the average desktop computer that uses about 200 watts of power, that means that this power plant 
can power about 70 million of those computers. That sounds like a lot. It is a lot, 70 million. However, that's only powering the computers. If you're in a South American country like Brazil, where you have a lot of heat and it very, gets very hot, you need to also cool those computers. And there's a rough rule of thumb that says for every watt that you use in powering the computer, you have to spend one watt in cooling the computer. So in reality, this is only 35 million computers that can be powered by this power plant. Now, that sounds still like a lot, but we have to look back in history that from the first 60 years of computer history, from about 19 45 to 19, or 2005, it took us that long to generate the first one billion computers. I still remember the day that Digital Equipment Corporation said, we sold our one millionth VAX computer. But today, that still seems to be a small number. And, you know, so it took us 60 years to get that far. Now, most people say, most economists say, it only take us another five to six years to generate the next one billion computers. And that's because of things like the price of the hardware dropping dramatically and the capability of the systems going up dramatically. The internet spreading, communication spreading. No longer do we talk analog uh, communications. We talk digital communications and that almost requires a computer system of some type the other end. But the other interesting part of this problem is that that means there will be 2 billion computers out there, but there's 6.3 billion people in the face of the planet, which means we need another 4.3 billion computers on top of that in order for everybody to have their one computer. Even that is not enough because in the United States, there are many, many households that have computers spread throughout their house. There's a computer in the living room, there's a computer in the kitchen, there's a computer in the bedrooms, there's a computer in the basement. And so there's lots and lots more of these computers, sometimes more than one computer per person in the household. Now, I will illustrate that by a gentleman I met in a computer store in the United States. Uh, we were going there to give a talk about Myth TV, and this gentleman shows up and he tells me that he has nine petabytes of data in his basement that he has recorded through his recording TV system. He has recorded every TV show he's ever watched. He has copied every movie he has ever watched. He has a continuous stream of music coming into his house, which he stores into his systems. And all of this he wants available all the time. And I could only imagine that the electric meter on his house is going around like this, trying to keep all of these discs up. He admitted to me his electric bill was very high. <laughs> so this is the problem, right? We have computers now that are every place. We don't even think about them anymore. It's, it's kind of omnipresent. I mean, you have a computer in your microwave oven. You have a computer, you know, in your TV set. You know, I have a computer in my refrigerator. Yesterday, there was an argument between my refrigerator and my microwave oven. <laughs> my microwave oven says, I know what you have in there. It's really ucky in the refrigerator. It says, you're going to cook it no matter what. No. It's horrible, you know, you come down there in the morning, you just don't want to hear the argument. <laughs> but this is even more the case. This is Mr. Thad Starner of Georgia Tech. He is one of the original cyborg people. He, this is a project to see what would happen is if you had a computer all the time, always in front of you, never off. You use the computer as if you were using your glasses. You don't think about using your glasses, you just use them. That's the way they wanted to think about computers. And this requires a very, very low power computer system and very powerful and powerful communications and omnipresent communications. So again, the, the type of thing we have to think about is power to run it, power to cool it, 
And if the thing is off, is it really off? Most modern computer systems are never off. There's something about them that's always running. You know, TV systems. Recently in the United States, we did a study. We found out that most TV systems, even when they were off, would still be using 10 to 15 to 20 watts of power in the off state. Uh, these little dongles, or, or what we call wall warts or transformers, these things are not our friends. They use a lot of power, even when it's off. If you feel it and it's warm, it's using power. And we need to get better and more efficient ways of converting electricity. It would be better if we didn't have to convert it at all, if perhaps we could gather electricity from photocells, which produce 12 volts, charge a battery, and then immediately use that 12 volts into our computer systems so that there was no conversion back and forth. And it may be very expensive for people to get electricity. It isn't always that electricity is not available. However, some people have to get electricity through gas generators or things like that. We call these people off the grid. One of my company's uh, best customers was a Buddhist monastery in Canada. They purposely had removed themselves from the electric grid because their philosophy being tied to the electric grid was being bad. It was being tied to the world and the worldly things. And so they purposely had generators that would generate the electricity. And so they were paying about $1 per kilowatt instead of the normal 23 to 14 cents per kilowatt that you would get if you were hooked up to the electric grid. Or your electricity may be unreliable. In Baghdad, the electricity is typically on for about three hours a day, and then it turns off. And so if they're trying to run their computer systems, they can't run them unless they either have a portable generator or they have some type of batteries. If you can reduce the amount of power that your computer system uses, you might be able to charge the batteries during those three hours and then run off of the batteries for the rest of the day. Here's an example of a computer system and actually a telephone system. This was a um, system that was used in Africa a lot. There's an asterisk uh, PBX system in that box. And this is made by a company called Innovo. And they go around and selling these to African villages so that they can have telephone. Now you see a photo cell in there. That's one way of charging it. But the other way of charging it is the bicycle with a generator. And when Invono goes to these African companies or villages and says, which would you like, the photo cell or the bicycle? Almost invariably, they choose the bicycle. And they say, why? The, the solar cell, you have lots of good sunlight. The solar cell would be so much easier. They said, well, the photo cell is very expensive. And it would be hard for us to get another one in case it breaks. But we have lots of broken bicycles. And we have lots of cars that do not work. But their alternator is very good. But most importantly, if we use the photo cell, we don't have a job for the person to pedal the bicycle. <laughs> so they have a different way of looking at things than most European or, or other, other parts of the world do. They want to create jobs for their people. Here's another problem we have with computer systems. Uh, this, in particular, is much like the landfill near my house. It used to be you would drive down into the valley to dump your garbage, and now you have to drive up the mountain to dump your garbage. <laughs> and if we keep dumping computer systems out, we will have mountains of computer systems eventually. Fortunately, we're moving away. We finally understood the issue of all of the bad chemicals that we used to put in our computer systems. And now we have some compliance guidelines to produce computer systems that will not pollute if they are then, and, and are easier to be recycled than if you use bad uh, chemicals. And if you buy modern computer systems, you should look for the ROH brand, 
ROHS branding on them to make sure that they are at least meeting modern day standards uh, for manufacture. Uh, in the United States, and particularly in California, whenever you buy a computer system, you're actually paying a little bit of money to be able to recycle it and decompose it back to its original parts to help with the landfill problem. But another thing that small systems can do is save disk, desk space. It's interesting to walk into companies and see this very nice desk that people had that's half covered by some large PC that's sitting there. And instead, if you have a very small but yet powerful PC, you could even do something like mount it on the back of your LCD panel and have nothing, uh, a very small footprint on your desk, or hang your LCD panel on the wall and have no footprint on your desk. And with systems that have very low power, you don't necessarily need a very strong fan, which is going to create a lot of noise. This also helps with longevity of the system, and we'll see that in a few minutes. One of the interesting things that hospitals are finding out is that a great place for germs to grow is inside of a PC. The germs get into the PC, they find a very nice, warm environment, and they sit there and they grow, and then all of a sudden the PC says, I'm too hot, it starts up at fan and blows the germs all over the place. Mm -hmm. So now a lot of hospitals are thinking about using thin clients at nursing stations and doctor stations with membrane sealed keyboards that are easily disinfected to keep down the number of germs that are spread around. So recently I was working with a company called Kulu, and I still do, uh, we, where we're working with very, very low power systems. And we started thinking about what would happen if your computer system only used 10 watts or less of power. About one-sixth of the light of the power that's used by one of these light bulbs. Because one of the things that people do is they turn off their computer system because it's noisy, because it uses a lot of power. But if you reduce the power that you use in your computer system, so you don't really feel guilty about having it on all the time, then your whole thought about the computer system changes. It can become your alarm clock. It can become your calendar. It can become your telephone. It can become your TV. It can become your radio. It's all these things that your one computer system could be because you're leaving it on all the time. And so we thought about the concept of always on computing. And the long lifetime of a device that has no moving parts, that's completely solid state, would allow you to spread the cost of this not over a three-year typical payback time on a computer system, but nine or 10 years. Think about the things in your house that you replace every so often in computers versus your radio or your TV that have no moving parts. I have a stereo system, it finally died on me, it was 20 years old. And now I go out and I find out that I, I can no longer buy a stereo system, I have to have seven channel surround sound stuff, it's quite daunting. But, but your longer lifetime allows you to pay this off and reduces the overall cost. Now, a lot of the technologies that are coming out have experienced or, or, or reacting to this need for power. Part of this was because originally in computer, um, server, in computer server centers, the electricity was paid for by the people who ran the building. And the people who ran the computers did not have to pay for their electricity. As soon as the shift was sent, so the computer center had to pay for the electricity. That's when the computer center people started worrying about things like consolidation, saving power, and things like that. And that put a strain back on the manufacturers who said, maybe what we should be doing is creating systems that use a lot less power. The AMD Geode, for instance, very, very low power chip. The VIA, new VIA systems coming out, extremely low power. And then the Intel Menlo chipsets, which not only have a low power for the CPU, but also do things like 3D graphics in relatively low power, um, 
MPEG compression and decompression in hardware, other things. And the Intel Menlo chipsets are very impressive in the fact that they will run in operating temperatures of up to 85 degrees Celsius. Now in certain places in Brazil, for instance, it's easy for a person's house to get up to 45 degrees Celsius. And so what you need is something which will operate in a temperature at least that high or higher, or else you may have a high failure rate of your systems when they're coming back to the manufacturer. Now, this whole space of economical computing is a great place for research. A lot of the research which was done on computer systems about the utilization of memory, CPU versus memory, CPU versus disk, accesses, things like that, things like locality of reference of the CPU for memory, all these things, garbage collection. A lot of this work was done 20 years ago, 30 years ago. I think it's time to revisit this work. As an example, most Unix systems do not refresh the memory once they have swapped something out. If the, mem if the RAM memory has not been overwritten by another process, the CPU and the operating system assumes that the data is still there and does not read the data back in off of disk. This means, of course, that that memory has had to have its power on all that time because if you turn off the power, then the memory would forget. Maybe we need to re-look re at this and say we need two types of swapping. One type of swapping where we swap the data out and we maintain the memory because it's a small period of time. Others, we're going to swap it out, turn off the memory, and then when we need to swap the data back in, actually go out to the disk and read it in and refresh the memory. In very large Beowulf systems with huge memories on each node, this would save a lot of electric power. Now I'd like to switch to the ease of use thing. This is my parents. My father is 87, my mother is 85. They have a problem with using anything that has more than one button to it. And, and yet, they would like to use their computer because they would like to be able to send email, they would like to be able to uh, browse the web. But these are the problems that they have. They don't want to spend hours every day trying to install the software or spend hours every day in fixing viruses or spend hours every day in upgrading their system. They want something that basically is like a lot of the other appliances in their house they either go over and turn it on and it works or they leave it on all the time and it works. And they certainly don't want to have to worry about any networking issues. And as far as my father is concerned, backups is something you do with the car to move it into the parking place. <laughs> they just want to email and surf the web. Now, they're one branch of this. and You might say, okay, they're old, old people, and there's no hope for them and everything else. <laughs> but there's another part to digital inclusion that is very important. I still remember when the web was new, and I was driving through San Francisco, and I was driving down the street, and I looked up in at the billboard at the top of a building. And there, on that billboard, there was only one phrase. www.bankofamerica.com No telephone number, no address, nothing else was on that billboard except that URL. And I said to myself, they have just eliminated about three quarters of their customer base. <laughs> because three, three quarters of their customer base really at that time had no idea what that meant. And this is something we should not be doing. We should be inclusive of people. We should move more people into the internet, more people into computing, and not take the cavalier attitude that these people are helpless or hopeless because they don't know how, what we do in using computers. 
So Nicholas Negroponte had this wonderful dream, one laptop per child. You know, the four billion extra people in the face of the earth, we're going to give them laptops. And we're going to bring the internet to them. And I said, that's a wonderful dream, Nicholas. But, you know, I've been to some of those places that you've talked about, and I don't see the internet there. And he says, oh, it's there. I says, well, no, let's take a look right here, right here. Look, do you see the internet? I don't see the internet. <laughs> I see a tree with maybe one child sitting underneath of it with his little laptop with the antennas coming up. And Nicholas said, well, John, if you turn around, there's the internet behind you. I said, Nicholas, I have turned around, and there's only more trees and more planes. But I will give him credit that he got people thinking about this and thinking about digital inclusion and thinking about lowering the price and thinking about bringing the internet. And so let me show you my African planes. There they are. This is a favela in Brazil. There's very high density there. They have electricity. But the internet is about 50 feet away from them, not 500 miles. And what I think is a great thing is that if we could bring this internet only that extra 50 feet and make it available to all these people, that it would still have a huge impact. And I say, you know, Nicholas, I'm glad you're worried about that one kid in the middle of the African plains, but I'm worried about the 2.4 million kids in places like Sao Paulo or Buenos Aires or Chicago <laughs> or Watts, because even in the United States, there are places that have no internet, no digital inclusion. We need to address that. And people have been trying to do this. A large computer company with the, I won't say what their name is, but their initials are HP, was working on a project one time <laughs> called the Volksputer. And they were trying to put four video cards and four keyboards and four mice into one system box so that four people could share the same CPU. And that was nice. And it was a, they could have it as, as either diskful or diskless. And that was a step forward. It was something that used imagination to cut down on the price of bringing computing to people. Here's another example of something that was a, a good idea. It's called the Simputer. This is a project that was done in India. And it was the idea of a community computer, that the community would own the computer and each individual person would own only a flashcard. And so when you needed to use the computer, you would go to the village leader. The village leader would loan you the computer, sign it out like a library, and you stick your flashcard in, and then you could do all the computing and communication you wanted to, and then you would pull out your flashcard and give the computer back, and that was how they would do it. Unfortunately, it was a little bit too expensive at the time, and didn't have quite the types of things that they wanted to see, but it was still a reasonable idea. But I went to the Brazilian government and started talking about thin computing systems and stuff like that. Uh, Cesar Alvarez, who was second in command to Lula, met with me and he said, Mad Dog, all these are great ideas, but you know, people don't want a dull, plain little box, even though it's low power and low cost. What they really want is sex. I says, well, you know, I want sex, you know. No, you don't understand. He says, they want something sexy. They want like a notebook. They want something like a phone or something like that. They want something that they can proudly show that they're not, they didn't get this just because they were poor. They got this and it's the same as everybody else is using. And I said, I understand that. So fortunately, what's happening now is we're having projects like OpenMoco come out, and the free runner and other open phones that people can put free software that's on there, open software, and people can start using it in ways that the telephony companies couldn't possibly think about or push because you take a million minds and put them together and all of a sudden you've got great ideas coming out. 
that is hard for any telephony company to think about it. But I have to keep reminding people that this is not just a phone. But in reality, it's a computer. And what I want to do is to take that board, and instead of holding it here, I want to put it down here with a nice big battery on it, and then I want to become a cyborg. <laughs> and I want to be able to utilize the computer like a computer, and then have all sorts of interesting peripheral devices hooked up to it so that I can see what's going on. And this is one of the reasons why I think having Debian on the free runner is so important. Yes, you could put something like Android on the phone, but then you're seeing somebody else's vision for what it should be. By having Debian on the phone, you automatically open it up for anybody's vision of what the phone should be, not just what Google thinks it should be or what even OpenMoco thinks it should be. It's a variety of different things. So item one for our last mile is a rugged, affordable, efficient, sexy system. Next thing we have to think about is communications. And we have a wide variety of different communications models to choose from. We need to think about all of them together. There's a lot of people talking about wireless mesh. There's a lot of people talking about, you know, uh, WiMAX, things like that. But I think that some of the most interesting parts or some of the projects going on, like FON, like the Wi Fi, free Wi Fi in Beijing, China. I was at a conference recently and I met with one of the people from Beijing who was talking about the work they were doing there. And the government decided that they were going to open up their wireless network and allow have people to have free access to Wi Fi in any of the government buildings. Then the government went to the universities and said, if you open up your Wi-Fi, then when you come to our government buildings, you can have access to our Wi-Fi also. And then once that was done, the government went to a private industry and said, if you open up your Wi-Fi, and we'll show you how to open it up so it's safe and secure and people are only using a portion of your bandwidth, then every time you come to a university or come to a government building, you get free Wi-Fi. And finally, they went to the homeowners who had uh, Wi-Fi in their homes and said, if you open up your Wi-Fi, and we'll show you how to do it, then when you come to a university or to a company or to the government, you get free Wi-Fi. And now almost all the parts of Beijing you go to, you can get free Wi-Fi by the very simple fact of the people had it every, anyway. And they said, why not open it up? And these types of things are making Wi-Fi ever more prevalent around the world in areas that you can now have almost omnipresent Wi-Fi. So item two for our last mile is high-speed communications and a support strategy to keep that going. Again, sustainable. We need it to be sustainable. Now, a lot of people say, well, Mad Dog, the reason I buy my software from large companies is because it's sustainable. The large companies I know are always going to be there. And I say, oh, really? Large companies like Apollo, Wang, Data General. Raise your hand when you remember one of these. <laughs> <laughs> Digital Equipment Corporation, yes. Compaq, yes. No, these were all at one time, one of the largest computer companies on the face of the earth. And while digital was bought by Compaq and Compaq was bought by Hewlett Packard, there was a lot of technologies which simply disappeared. And that's a problem. And one of the, re one of the things that really is sustainable is free software. Because even if a person stops working on the project, as long as the source code is available, somebody else may pick that project up and continue on with it. And at least you have the ability to make the business decision about whether you could continue with that software or not. So I go out and I travel to many different countries around the world and I see lots of good intentions. Rooms filled with donated soft hardware 
that unfortunately are locked because there's nobody who can run the hardware anymore. There's nobody who can upgrade the software anymore. And there's nobody using these rooms full of donated equipment. People say, well, we'll train people to do this. And they go out to these little villages and they train people how to run this equipment. And it works for a while until all of a sudden the person says, I'm very trained. I can leave this little village and go to the big city and I can earn twice or three times the amount of money in the big city that I can in this little village. And they leave and they don't train anybody else. So as part of these plans for these things, we need to be able to show these people how they can make a good living, not just a reasonable living, not just a marginal living, but a good living so that they will stay there and before they leave, if they're going to leave, they will train the next person. Maybe we need as part of these business models that there's always two people in a particular place. The person who's running it and their heir that's going to move up when that person leaves. Now a great example of this is the Indian phone company. A lot of times in an Indian village there will be a phone that somebody will purchase and that person becomes the phone company. If a telephone call comes into that phone, they will answer it and then they will carry the phone to whoever's house is actually being called. And that person will then pay them money to receive that call at their house. Likewise, if somebody wants to make a call, they walk to the person's house who has the phone and they pay them to make the call. And this person makes a living off of being the phone company for the village. <laughs> There's also telecenters. These have been very, very uh, popular and very successful in a lot of places. They not only bring computing to the community, but they also bring communications to the community. Whether they're using asterisk as a PBX system or whether they're just you know, simple voice over IP. They're also a place where you can get access to scarce computing facilities like high-grade printers or scanners or things like that. A friend of mine who does a lot of work in Thailand said, you know, Mad Dog, we talk about e-government and we talk about things like having huge databases and we talk about things like having electronic voting machines and the issues with that. He says, let me tell you what e-government is in Thailand. If you're a farmer in Thailand and you need to sign a paper with the government, it means you leave your farm and you walk for about two days to the government building. They have you sign the form and then you walk two days back from the government building. That's four days worth of work that you've lost. But now what you do is you go to a telecenter, they email the PDF document to the telecenter, the telecenter prints it out, you sign it, they scan it in, they email the same document back, and that is e-government in Thailand, right? It saved the farmer four days worth of walking, and that's four days they can put to working on their farm. So again, you know, a lot of the, thi a lot of the complex solutions that we may think of as something that they need, they actually think of a much simpler solution. But what they need is communications, and they need the electronics. Here's a telecenter which is in the, in the heart of Toronto, Canada. Not exactly a third world nation, but there's a lot of people in the neighborhood who make use of the telecenter because they're either homeless or they uh, don't, just don't have access to computers or they're learning how to use a computer. Now these telecenters could provide their services for my mother and father. If my mother and father had a very, very simple computer in their house that was just a, w a web browser, the telecenter could provide the server space for them. It could provide a setup of applications for them. And this is not some far off company like Google. This is a very local place where you can go and you can talk with the owner of the computer center and you can form a relationship with them. They can sit down and show you how to use the software. They can answer your questions. And you may pay them a small amount of money every month 
to do this. They would do the backups for you. This person would earn a living doing this and you would get much better support on a much friendlier basis than a long range company. Now, one of the reasons why free software technical companies fail is a lot of times there's a single person who says, I want to start up a consulting business. And that's fine. And you go out and you do consulting and everything. But a lot of times businesses look at you one person and say, what happens if you die? What happens if you get run over by a truck? You know, you really need to think about the longevity of you, you as a consulting partner with the company or the, or, the, or the business that you're going to. And so one of the things that I do is I go around and talk to people about ways of making money with free software. How do you create a sustainable business? And I remember one time that I was going to the Usenix organization and during their conference I was going to give a talk on how to make money with free software. And they said, well, uh, nobody will come to that talk. It's on the last day. We're all technical people. But when we got there, the room was filled with people. And I asked a very simple question, and I'll ask it here. How many of you have the title of either CEO of your company, CTO of your company, CIO of your company, or otherwise you're in a company where you have to wear a hat that's both technical and business. Right. And this is why you need to think about the business aspects of free software as well as the technical aspects of free software. What does it mean to your customer? What, what, what is missing from your offerings to your customer that would stop them from using free software? Business is not what we call in the United States a four-letter word. All of the curse words in, in, in English seem to be four letters, right? <laughs> but business is not a four-letter word. You know, financing and cash flow and marketing and doing all these things to find out what your customer wants and how you can provide those services to them is a very big part of the free software business. And what I keep doing is I go around talking to people about free software. I go, it is not the cost of the software that is the issue. It is the value of the software. I give an example. You go out and you buy a CD at a store and you take it home and you install it on your computer. It takes you an hour of your time. You pay five pesos for the CD and an hour of the time to install it. That's the cost of the solution. You start up the software, it does absolutely nothing. So the value of the solution is zero. You go back to the store, you buy another CD, five pesos, take it home, install it, an hour of your time. But when you start up the software, immediately your dog can let itself in and out of the house without help. Your spouse comes home, kisses you on the cheek, goes in the kitchen, makes a fantastic dinner, takes you upstairs, you make love the entire night. <laughs> let me tell you, at the age of 58, that alone is a miracle. <laughs> your kids come home from school, they have the straight A's for the first time in their entire life, and a tax collector calls you up and says, we made a mistake and we owe you $200,000. And it's all because of the software on that CD. That software to you is infinitely valuable. And you don't care you paid five pesos in an hour of your time. <laughs> it was Debian. If it was Ubuntu, they only would have found $100,000. <laughs> but, but this is the point. You have to make your customers understand that they're no longer ruled by the value that the producer of the software created for them. They're now free to create the value of their own imaginations. This is the part of business that you need to get across. And so when we're talking about digital inclusion, what type of jobs, what type of opportunities could you create for the village to be able to use free software so they can create sustainable businesses so they can buy more of your services. This is a part of this. Free software is a business enabler. It allows business to increase and 
This, you know, in their own language, with their own culture, this is the type of thing we should be pushing, not just the technical part of the system. It allows better government. The uh, places in AIDS where you're trying to investigate AIDS, you really need to use geographical information software because it doesn't make any sense for you to advertise about preventing AIDS in places where they, they have virtually no AIDS. But on the other hand, if there's places where the AIDS rate is 70% or 80%, that is the place where you really need to advertise about the use of contraceptives, condoms, even abstinence. But this is the place where you use these tools to figure out where to put your money in doing this. There's all sorts of applications out there way above the Linux kernel. And one of the things I really enjoyed was learning about the, the, the project of putting together these packages of software. I think they called it the DISH project, of putting together packages of software so people can easily find the software they need to do their work. And if you are thinking about putting a business or starting a business up with free software, what I strongly recommend is you consider the concept of using a cooperative, where you get together with a group of other free software developers and you share resources such as legal, secretarial, sales resources, marketing resources, it also gives the customer a entity, a legal entity, that they think will be around longer than the single person. It gives them more faith that if they come back in two years with a, another problem, that that entity will still be there. So one more story about my friend in Thailand, which I think is interesting. Um, he had this farmer come to him. I, I should back up a little bit. One of the criticisms of the One Laptop Per Child program has always been, should we give the child a laptop <coughs> when they don't have food or clothing or things like that? I firmly believe that the child needs both. They need access to the information that the laptop represents, and they need the food. But my friend in Thailand had a farmer come to him and said, you have some land, you're not using it for anything. Could I grow a crop? My friend said, of course. So the farmer went to the bank, borrowed the money, got some seed, planted the crop. Unfortunately, the land was very wet and the crop <coughs> rotted in the fields, it was no good. So the farmer lost everything he had. The next year, the farmer came back to my friend, said, I'd like to try again, but first, I want to use the internet to see if there's another crop which would work better. So my friend let him use his internet. The farmer spent a couple days there, had an idea, went back to the bank. The bank listened to the idea, lent him some more money. The farmer got the seed for the crop, planted it. The crop thrived. The farmer made huge amounts of money. And he paid back the bank for both of the loans, and everything was great. Can anybody think of what the crop was that he raised? No. Rice? Rice would have been a good idea. The only problem is that rice is so cheap in Thailand, he would have had great competition, and he wouldn't have earned that much money, really. Frogs. He got a whole bunch of little tadpoles, put them in the pond on it. The, the, frag, the tadpoles turned into frogs. They thrived in the wet land because of all the insects. They become very fat. He sold them to the restaurants and made a lot of money. <laughs> he became the frog king of that part of Thailand. Okay. So the internet is an idea generator. And that is what people need. They need to know how to make clean water. They need to know how to make business and how to share ideas. Here's another example, a simple business of basket weaving. 
If the person has a connection to the internet, they can create courses in how to make baskets. They can sell their baskets through the basket weaving. They get much better money than trying to sell them in the native marketplace. And these are types of things, very simple businesses, but is useful. And if you think that this is just an example that I dreamt up, there is a group of women in India who have formed a cooperative. They're selling their baskets through Macy's department store in New York and making a lot of money for their village. Self-publishing books and magazines and articles about native culture. Here's an interesting part. In South Africa, there's a town called Soweto, very, very poor township. It was the place where the first riots of apartheid started. I went there one time with a friend of mine who worked for the government, and as I looked out over Soweto, I said, this is a natural bowl. It's a perfect place for mesh networking. My friend said, sure, no, never happened in Soweto. And I started talking to him about Soweto. I says, I'll bet even in Soweto, they have people working on open source software. He goes, no way, not in Soweto. But he went back to his government and they asked about it. And sure enough, they did find one person in Soweto. He was not only working with free software out of his house, he was conversing with Linus Torvalds about a problem in the AMD microprocessor memory management system and was helping Linus diagnose what was wrong and fix the problem. And the government was so impressed by this that they opened up a satellite open source development center in Soweto to do both training and have people uh, work with it. So Adam 3 for, uh, for the last mile is a suitable, sustainable business plan for free software. So here's my summary. I believe the internet should be omnipresent. And until it is, we haven't finished our job. The computer should be on all the time and be of such low power that we don't care that they're on all the time. That information accessibility should be a right and not a privilege. And that emerging economies include Center City, Chicago, Appalachia, the United States, and uh, New Orleans after Katrina. And I always like free software because I never know where the next Albert Einstein is going to come from. It could come from Soweto. It could come from Watts. It could come from Argentina. And free software allows us to see who is good. It allows the cream to rise to the top so we can skim it off. We can find those people. Closed source software hides them from us. You know, maybe the next Albert Einstein of computer software will come from as unlikely a place as Helsinki, Finland. <laughs> and so with that, I'd like to thank a whole bunch of people. Kulu Incorporated for paying my salary and IBM who helped me with sustaining funds to come here. The conference organizers for giving me a chance to talk, the free and open source community, and you, of course. And if you want to see the most important person in free software, you get up in the morning, just look in the mirror. Thank you very much. <laughs>